Today's movie is a special request from Patreon supporter Rob Nasty Rocker, who coincidentally also happens to be a bass player. Hmm. Anyway, Rob asked me to review the movie Crying Freeman, which is yet another example of the Western adaptation of a popular anime or manga series. And if you know my track record with these movies, so far they haven't exactly been stellar. But hey, the second Guyver movie was pretty good, so who knows, maybe this will actually get things right. Crying Freeman is a 1995 action movie from French director Christophe Gaon, who also made the French cult classic The Brotherhood of the Wolf, as well as Silent Hill, and a Beauty and the Beast movie that isn't just a copy of the cartoon version. Crying Freeman is based off of a popular manga, which has also been adapted into an anime series, as well as two Hong Kong produced movies which actually came out before this one. Now I'm not familiar with either the manga or the anime, but from what I understand, this is considered one of the better western adaptations out there, which of course means it's also one of the lesser known ones. In fact, this didn't get an official release in the US until 2018 when Amazon started streaming it. And for the record, even the live action Fist of the North Star movie managed to get a release in the US. Oh well, I guess it's still more widely available than the two Hong Kong versions, so that's something. Fun fact, Crying Freeman is also what fans call it whenever Valve teases making another Half-Life game. The CGI during this title sequence may be pretty dated by today's standards, but compared to some other 90s comic book movies, eh, it's not that bad. So, as you would expect for a movie based on a Japanese comic, we open on some white chick's birthday. Today is my birthday, and for the first time in 20 years, I am not alone. You see, I met someone. A man. Oh, well that's good news. Congratulations. A killer. And soon he will kill me. Um, okay, uh, well, as long as he makes you happy before he kills you. This is Emu Ohara. Yes, that really is her name. Emu's a professional artist who took a trip to San Francisco to paint, because I guess that's the only place she knows with trees and water nearby. And just her luck, she's busy trying to paint some happy little trees when she gets interrupted by a John Woo movie. Well, looks like our main character's arrived, and if you're wondering why the movie's called Crying Freeman... <laughs> It's because he feels really sad after he kills somebody. Well, at least he's polite enough to introduce himself after he's killed several people right in front of you. My name... is Yo. Hey, sup Yo? Yo is played by Mark DeCascos, who you might remember from my China Strike Force video. Or maybe you just know him from Iron Chef America. Judging by the comments, that seems to be where most people know him from. Not only is Yo a deadly assassin, but he's also apparently Batman. Emu then goes home. I guess witnessing several murders really put a damper on her vacation. Hey, uh, where does she live anyway? Huh. Okay, usually in the 90s movies were just filmed in Vancouver. It's kind of nice to see one that actually takes place there. Yo also makes his way to Vancouver, but first he's gonna have to get through customs. And they do not appreciate people bringing in undeclared fruitcake. Clay? You're bringing clay into the country? I'm a potter. You see, the trick is to find the right mud. I dry it, lump it into small pieces, and carefully sift it. Miss? Is there a problem here? No. Let that be a lesson, everyone. If you want to smuggle shit into another country, just be dreamy. Good thing that pottery trick worked. Yo was really getting tired of putting his gun in a condom and swallowing it. If you're wondering why Yo's in Vancouver, the guy he killed at the beginning was the son of a powerful Yakuza boss who's also currently in the city meeting with the police. Oh, and there's also another reason he's in Vancouver. A woman who lives in your city witnessed the murder. Her name is Emu O'Hara. The assassin will come to kill her. If he was supposed to kill her to eliminate any witnesses, why didn't he just do it then? It's not like there was anybody else around. Waiting several days until she's in another country seems a little sloppy. I gotta admit, for a low-budget movie, this does have a pretty impressive cast. We've got Mako playing the Yakuza boss, Radon Chong, and even Cheki Kario playing an Interpol agent. The roots of the Sons of the Dragons are very old and run very deep. Fourteen centuries ago, 
the Manchus overthrew the Chinese emperor. Unfortunately, it looks like Chek Ikario's real voice didn't make it into Canada. Maybe you should have tried flirting with the customs agent. Whoever they got to dub his voice does sound familiar, though. Who is that? Okay, nice choice. Not quite as awesome as if they used Keith David, but still pretty good. Anyway, the Yakuza boss explains that Yo is an assassin for a Chinese gang called the Sons of the Dragons, known as a Freeman, and he tells the police to allow him to kill Emu or else he'll start a gang war. Hopefully this one will be a little better choreographed than the last one I covered. Joke's on the Yakuza, though. Turns out Yo's on his way to assassinate them. Either that or he's about to audition for Slipknot. Oh, and remember when I mentioned John Woo earlier? <laughs> Something tells me Kristoff might have been a fan of his. I mean, he seems to have most of his tricks down. The slow-mo, the over-the-top gunplay. All that's missing are some doves. Oh, wait, I forgot we're in Vancouver, so it'd probably be Canada geese. Well, I see Mako's done with his cameo. Better get the hell out of here. Yo. Yo, how's it going? They were right about one thing, Yo is under strict orders to kill Emu, although he sure keeps missing his chances. Yo, however, has second thoughts. He's a real sucker for anyone who makes fan art of him. Meanwhile, the police are gonna have some questions for Emu. Yo. Yo, what's up? Is this a Japanese name? Is he Japanese? Mmm, technically Mark Dacascos is Hawaiian-Irish-Japanese, but, eh, close enough. The police want to find Yo or else the Yakuza will start a gang war, so better just do what the criminals tell you. You know, for somebody who just paints trees, Emu has a really nice house. Just imagine if she also had an ASMR channel. Hey, thanks for coming by. I was waiting for just the right dramatic moment to reveal myself. Even if this movie does veer a little close to being pretentious at times, it's at least making the effort to be stylish and artistic, as opposed to this, which felt like a generic direct-to-video movie. Emu's in luck, though. Instead of killing her, Yo's only interested in slaying something else. He really puts the ass in Assassin, which seems to be a common thing for Mark Dacascos. Alright, time to show Emu his Yo face. Meanwhile, some Yakuza thugs show up to take out the Freeman, and I really gotta give it to Mark DeCascos. Not many guys can look tough while wearing a jock strap. Still, the smart assassin always remembers to bring backup. <laughs> That's for cock-blocking me, motherfucker. Yo's partner also tells him to finish off Emu, but he just can't bring himself to do it. It is really hard to kill somebody when you still have a boner. Also, how the hell is this guy still alive? <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, that answers that. Yo's partner is still upset he refuses to finish off Emu, but Mark DeCascos can't kill her. That's his future wife. Three days later, I awoke in the hospital. My father died here before I had a chance to ask his forgiveness. Yeah, and that was just when he was supposed to be getting his tonsils taken out. You might want to move to a different hospital. If the director truly is a John Woo fan, then the last 40 minutes of the movie is just going to be one long shootout in this hospital. Oh, never mind. Looks like Emu's made her escape. Better go after her, fellas. Fight. Take my hand. Fight. Damn, I knew the Vancouver Police Department shouldn't have used movie cars for their squad cars. And I guess that's it for Radon Chong. I think she had more lines in that Tales from the Dark Side segment where she played a gargoyle. Emu makes her way to Japan in order to find Yo. Meanwhile, I think the Yakuza guy from earlier is busy trying to make his own John Woo movie. Either that or he's weirdly foreshadowing the Matrix with all this green-colored tinting. He also declares war on the Sons of the Dragons unless they deliver the Freeman to him. Whatever, I think this guy's just jealous that Yo's back tattoo is cooler than his. Also, I'm not sure if the Sons of the Dragons leader is supposed to be Paime or the Crypt Keeper? Alright, well as long as this means they hire Billy Zane to kill the Freeman, I'm okay with it. Meanwhile, I see Emu's found Yo. Now they can reenact that famous scene from Ghost. First though, Yo's got to explain his origin. Who would ever guess that the executioner for the Sons of the Dragon it's just a simple putter. 
Seven years ago was my first exhibition. This work was my 15 minutes of fame. Oh yes, the fast intoxicating world of professional pottery. The drugs, the money, the women. Yeah, it was fun at first, but eventually I found myself yearning for something more. So that's when I decided to become a professional killer. Turns out everything changed when Yo witnessed a murder at one of his shows, so I guess he really is like an art gallery version of Batman. Okay, actually he found some evidence of some of the Sons of the Dragon's criminal activities, and as a result, they kidnapped him and brainwashed him into becoming an assassin for him. And they must have used some pretty powerful drugs on him, too. Okay, I would have preferred if Ray Harryhausen brought that thing to life, but still pretty unexpected. Selecting Yo to be their Manchurian candidate was a big improvement for the Sons of the Dragons. Their last assassin was just some random artist they found on DeviantArt. Who sent these flowers? The Grim Reaper, asshole. Okay, as much as I make fun, I gotta admit that was pretty badass. You know, even though the Sons of the Dragons brainwashed Yo into killing form, it's still kinda his fault for being the most jacked pottery maker that's ever lived. And for the next part of his training, Asian John Waters here is gonna force him to eat a panda turd on camera. And your tears. Uh, come on, he's gotta cry whenever he kills somebody. I mean, it is part of the title. And despite being a crack assassin, Yo's peripheral vision ain't exactly the greatest. Yo's guide tells him to eliminate the Yakuza boss that declared war on the Sons of the Dragons earlier. You know, if you're already disobeying your programming, you could just kill this guy and go into hiding with Emu. But nah, might as well go to where the Yakuza are. Look, even Cheki Kario's there. Hopefully you remember to brush up on his Japanese. <laughs> Hoo <laughs> hoo, busted! Despite this though, Detective Nita still seems pretty confident. You should knock on the door. If I could, Ryuji, I would knock your head off. Don't make me stand here while you point guns at me again, asshole! So, turns out Ryuji set up Mako's family to get assassinated so he could become the head of the Yakuza. And Nita wants to get the Freeman, but he also has the hots for Ryuji's wife. But it turns out she really wants to be the leader of the Yakuza. Even though I'm not familiar with the manga, this does seem to be trying to condense a whole lot of plot into one movie. Which makes it similar to a lot of genuine anime films. And come Come on, Nita, you should have known this was a setup. You bitch! To rape the wife of a Yakuza boss is a very serious crime. Uh, I think just rape in general is a serious crime. Meanwhile, Yo makes his way to Ryuji, and you can tell he's in disguise because he's wearing a mustache. And I'm noticing a common theme for how these guys kill people. <laughs> They really seem to like burning people with alcohol. Alright, time to John Woo the hell out of this Yakuza gang. While it's pretty clear what Christoph Gaunt's influences are during these action scenes, at least he's able to execute them pretty well, which is more than I can say for Fist of the North Star. Hey, have I mentioned that this is better than Fist of the North Star? Cause so far this is way better than Fist of the North Star. Now you die, Freeman. <laughs> You see, that is why you always make sure you kill somebody before you start to get cocky. It was my job to serve and watch over you. You broke the law, my friend. You should have killed her. Yeah, well, now you're dead and I'm still alive, so really who made the right decision here? However, Yo apparently didn't do a good job covering his tracks since the Yakuza follow him to his house. Hey, fellas, just a friendly geisha here. Not sure who this white lady you're looking for is. You know, considering the setting, I think it's important to remember the teachings of Buddha. <laughs> Which is that if anyone tries to mess with your girlfriend, you need to fuck their asses up! And wisdom isn't the only thing Buddha has to share. Damn, Buddha's temples are badass! For somebody who cries every time he kills somebody, Yo straight up turns into Scarface during this finale. Uh, look, guys, I know you want to get the Freeman, but maybe just call it a wash. Trying to kill him seems like more trouble than it's worth. Jeez, can anything stop him? <laughs> What the fuck? You're slipping, yo! 
Not to worry though, Emu's finally taking some initiative in this movie. And besides, this just gives Yo a perfect excuse to take his shirt off. He didn't spend all that time in the gym not to show off a little. Here's another fun fact, Mark Dacascos helped choreograph this ending sword fight, and he actually does a good job. Although for his sake, I hope these Yakuza thugs don't remember they brought guns with them. <laughs> If you remove the knife, you will bleed to death. And if you keep it there, you'll die because there's a knife in your heart. Yo says that he'll spare her life in exchange for the Yakuza leaving him and Emu alone. Okay, looks like everything worked out alright. No! I didn't give my word. Dude, just let it go. Or don't. Yo and Emu then escaped, where they changed their names to Hay and Ostrich. The end. So that's Crying Freeman, and out of all the Western anime or manga adaptations to not be available in the US, they just had to pick one of the better ones, didn't they? Like I said, I'm not familiar with the manga, so I have no idea how faithful this movie is to it, but I can say that this is one of the only English language adaptations of a popular Japanese property to seem like it actually has some respect for what it's adapting. A lot of these kinds of movies either seem to go for an overly silly tone that seems like it's poking fun at the subject matter, or just kind of half-ass things with an adaptation that feels like it's not even trying, but this one actually seems like it gives a shit. Sure, some of the dialogue and acting can feel a little cold and stilted, at times, and if you're expecting a non-stop action fest, you might be disappointed since the movie is really more of a drama. But for a lower-budgeted movie from a first-time director, this has some genuine style to it. It's not as good as the best anime films out there, but it sure beats the hell out of the other English-language manga adaptations I've done on this show. So, of course, if you live in the U.S., they had to make it hard for you to actually see it. Eh, well, I guess when it comes to movies with scenes set in Vancouver, there's always Godzilla Final Wars. Oh, speaking of which, there's another Godzilla movie coming out next month. I should probably do another one of those pretty soon. Forget one thing, Blade. You're not in Japan here. Dirty bastard.